If you have your copy of God's Word this morning, please open to the book of Jonah. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the chair in front of you. And I'd encourage you to grab that and so that you can see the text for yourself in front of you. I'll ask you in the sermon to repeatedly look at that so that you can see for yourself what God has said in His Word. That will be in the Bible in your chair on page 523. That's where you'll find the book of Jonah. If you're looking for it in your Bible, just go to the New Testament and go backwards a few books. And then you'll find this small book of Jonah. If you found your way there, please go ahead and stand now. As we get to hear from the Lord, the final chapter in the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4, is what we'll be looking at today. So let's hear the word of the Lord together this morning. Jonah chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is... Not this what I said when I was yet in my country. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he became faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Catherine Vaughn. Drakenberg, who you may know as Kat Von D. Kat Von D is a celebrity tattoo artist, and she became famous because of the TLC reality show LA Inc. She's known for her gothic style and her associations with the macabre, and she's dabbled in pagan spiritism and witchcraft. She's very famous in pop culture. Your children know who she is. Uh, You may not know. She has 9.5 million followers on Instagram. And recently she made shockwaves in the pop culture world when she converted to Christianity and announced that by posting her baptism on her Instagram platform. She didn't join some celebrity megachurch, as we often see in these uh, type of celebrity conversions. She was converted and baptized in a small country Baptist church in Indiana, a church smaller than ours. Her conversion seems to be real. She had nothing worldly to gain and, in fact, pretty much everything to lose. So I always adopt a position of praise God for that. Let's see what happens. Uh, which is the same thing we adopt whenever we baptize anybody in our church, right? That's why we preach that you must persevere to the end. This sparked the usual backlash from people who you might would suspect, right? Some of her followers who obviously aren't Christians, the majority of them, 
um, some atheists and those in the pagan world. But the real backlash came, can you guess it from where? Can you guess from where? From the Christian community. Now, I use, maybe we should use air quotes when we say Christian community because I think it's probably as high as 90% in our culture who identify themselves as Christians but have no idea what Christianity is, don't know the gospel. But the reality is probably a good, good many of the people showing this great criticism to her were real, uh, real, real Christians. You know, she wears black, has tattoos all over her body. Her baptism even, her baptism was done wrong, right, because her hands didn't go under the water. Uh, the worst questioning probably perhaps is that this is just a publicity stunt. And if you read through the comments, you can really see the real vitriol uh, that she has to endure. Because one problem is I think people conflate justification and sanctification. Right? We, that is, justification is a declarative statement that God makes in Jesus Christ that the sinner is now righteous before him, not because of their, any work in themselves, but because of what Jesus has done on their behalf, that he died for sinners, that he was buried and raised on the third day, and now anyone who believes in him is forgiven and declared righteous. And they confuse all of that with sanctification, which is the continual act in someone's life where they are conformed more and more into the image of Christ, and they continually leave their sin over a period of their life, and they begin to look more like a Christian. And so there's this big error that occurs at the beginning that if someone were actually converted, that they wouldn't wear black. They maybe would have all their tattoos laser removed and they would stop wearing earrings and black eyeliner and being who they've been their entire life. And that's dangerous for the gospel to confuse justification and sanctification. But there's another place where, that comes, where this comes from. And there's another place. People do not think that God can do what he wants. Jonah has said that salvation is of the Lord. It means it belongs to him solely. He saves who he wants, how he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it. And people think God does save sinners, but he saves sinners like me. And after all, I wasn't that bad of a sinner. I look like everyone else. My sins weren't really that bad, I, well, after all, wasn't into witchcraft. Sure, he saves sinners, but does he really save people like that? The level of sin and depravity, the alternative, di alternative lifestyle, the dark style, that's beyond the scope of God's redeeming love. There is this sense, and it is usually unspoken, always unspoken, but, and probably even more unexplored in people's hearts, that God has no business messing around with sinners like that. People don't believe it is God's prerogative to save whoever He wants. Right there in the condition that they are in. People, normal people, they downplay the radical nature of the conversion of any sinner even the clean-cut, white-collar sinners, right? And then they see the conversion of people like Kat Von D. It becomes a scandal to the very people that claim to know God. It's as if you know, we don't really believe John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. How did God love? Right? So, for God so loved the world that He gave Jesus His only Son, that whoever believes that's anyone, would not perish but have eternal life. We want to turn that into whoever believes and conforms immediately into the image of Christ and does everything that I think a Christian should do is saved and has eternal life. The unspoken truth is that it makes us uncomfortable when God doesn't act as, if, as, as we think He should act because if He does, that means God does whatever He wants and I don't have control of God. Now, you may not have ever felt that type of tension with God before, that God has set His love on a people, on sinners, that I don't think He should, and it makes me uncomfortable. But you probably have experienced something similar 
when things happen in your own life that you don't like. Uh, something can happen inside you when you profess to believe in the sovereignty of God. So one, you profess to believe in absolute sovereign God. Then second, something happens which you don't think should have happened. It's in fact the opposite of how you think things should have gone in your life. And then you combine that with a prideful heart. And then those that claim to love God can become bitter and even angry with God. And that's exactly what we see happen in Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4, he believes in the sovereignty of God, but God does something he doesn't think God should have done. It should have gone differently. We see Jonah's prideful heart, and we see Jonah become exceedingly angry at God. Let me bring you back up to uh, where we are. This is the last sermon in this book, and you probably haven't been here for all of them. So the book begins in Jonah chapter 1. God initiates the story by coming to one of the prophets of Israel and calls him, commissions him to take his word to a Gentile people. It's the only time this happens in the Old Testament. It's a, it's a radical commission, and it's even more radical because Nineveh is exceedingly wicked. They're a terrorist regime. They are Hezbollah and Hamas with no powers to put them in check. That's what they are. And God sends a prophet to take his word to those people. And Jonah rebels against God. He, he quits. He quits on God. He flees God's presence, refuses to do what God asks him to do, goes to Joppa, finds a ship going to Tarshish, which is the, the furthest part of the world away from Nineveh that you can get. Probably Spain is what people believe it is. And on his way there, God hurls a storm upon the sea and stops him in his tracks in his rebellion. But the people who are manning that ship are pagans from various cultures, and they are able to discern this is a supernatural storm. And so they begin to all call out to their various gods, knowing that sin has caused this, uh, but it doesn't work. So then they find Jonah, and Jonah is outed through providential means that he's the cause of this. So they tell Jonah to call out to his God, and Jonah could have stopped the whole thing if he just would have repented, told him to turn around, but he doesn't. He says, throw me into the sea. He'd rather die. Jonah would rather die than to take the gospel to pagan, wicked sinners so that they might live. And so they call out to God, and, and they begin to pray to God and say, don't let us be held accountable for this man's death, and they throw him in the ocean. All the pagans then convert after they see that God calms the storm, the storm supernaturally, that they've been recipients of the grace of God. All the pagans convert. And so Jonah does what God wants him to do, even in his rebellion. But then Jonah is drowning. He's He's in the sea. He's going down into the sea. He's going down into the depths of Sheol to the underworld. And in his most desperate time of need, before he ever repents, before he ever can call out to God, God appoints a whale or a fish, a great fish. The Legacy Standard Bible says sea monster. And I kind of prefer that translation because we don't know what it was. A specially appointed, divinely appointed, supernatural means of salvation through judgment. That's what's pictured there. And we saw that pointed us to Jesus Christ, and Jesus uses the story of Jonah and talks about himself as Jonah was in the heart of the earth, or Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. The Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah. Behold, someone, something greater than Jonah is here. And the people would not listen to him, and they would not repent. So we saw Jonah points us to Christ in his experience of salvation through judgment. The fish then, Jonah then prays from the belly of the fish this great prayer of thanksgiving at God's deliverance, and that, that phrase, salvation of the Lord, is in that prayer. It's the heart of the book. Salvation is of the Lord. And then Jonah would see that firsthand. Uh, the fish spits him out on, on the beach. Jonah is compliant. He obeys God. He goes to Nineveh, and he preaches a sermon, and there's a mass conversion. That's what we saw last week. The grace of God poured out upon that city in the hearing of the word of God through the preacher, through the granting of, of grace that his God lavished belief upon them. He granted them belief. It's, it is the greatest miracle in the book of Jonah, and yet the book is known for the great fish. It's not known for the great conversion of Nineveh. That's kind of mysterious. I think it shows us what we really believe about salvation and how much of a miracle it is. But a whole city 
of at a minimum of 120,000 people and maybe upwards uh, 600,000 or more even, they all convert at the preaching, the hearing of the word preached, and they repent. It's a real repentance. And God relents of the disaster that he said he would do to them. God shows mercy upon them. God grants them mercy and grace. And now we pick up in the story with Jonah's response. What will Jonah's response be to the most successful evangelistic campaign in world history? That God used him in a single moment to convert more people in one single act than any time, even up until this day of all time. We'll see what his reaction will be today. And so that's where we pick up. It seems as though the story should have ended there, doesn't it, if you just read the story? It'd be a good, it'd be a good ending. It'd be a happy ending if it just ended at the conversion of Nineveh. But it doesn't end there. We go on to chapter 4, and it zeroes back into Jonah. And we see the condition of his heart and what's going on in his mind. We see what happened to him. And, it, and the book ends in a very strange way. The book ends with a question mark. It's as if the whole book has been written for this question mark. A question from God to Jonah. But it's not just for Jonah to answer the question. It's for future generations. So future generations of Israelites would read this book. And in a great irony, future generations of Israelites likely read this book while they were away in captivity in Nineveh. And they would have to grapple with the question at the end of this book. And we have to as well. It's as if the question is left there hanging for us. How will we answer this question that's at the end of the book? Will you align your will with God's will? Will you submit to the will of God? Can God be God? And is our heart aligned with His? And we're going to get there to have to grapple with this question by going through the text. So we'll see three movements in this text which force a personal self-examination at the end. So if you're taking notes, three movements in the text which force a personal examination in the end. And this is applicable in a whole host in a number of ways. You likely will never be in the position like Jonah was, but things in your life are going to go the exact opposite of the way you think they should go. Something's going to happen, right? And you know, right, because you profess the sovereignty of God over all things, that he could have done things differently. And there can be anger and discouragement in our hearts, or there can be humble submission and trust in the will of God. So my purpose is to present you this text in such a way that would force you to grapple with the question at the end for yourself. So let's see three movements in the text which force this personal examination. They're very easy to follow. It's Jonah's anger, Jonah's prayer, God's answer. So first let's look at Jonah's anger. And I'll restate them. Jonah's anger... One verse to consider in this section, that's verse 4-1. Look back at your text, you'll see it. It's clear as day. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. So the first question you ask is, what is it? What is it? And this is what it is. God showing mercy to Nineveh. Nineveh repented, and God relented of the disaster that he said he would do. Instead of pouring out his wrath and destroying A people who deserved it, right? If anybody deserves it, it's Nineveh. They have what's coming to them. But God doesn't pour out His wrath. He pours out His grace. And that's the it. That's what has made Him so mad. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. I'm really thankful for Hebrew scholars. You know, they're not preachers. You know, they sit, spend most of their days in an office translating Hebrew and some of them Greek. But Hebrew scholars... In this case, and they're able to uh, tell us the literal most wooden translation of this text is that it was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and he burned with anger. Let that sink in for a second. God's grace and mercy poured out on undeserving wicked people was an evil thing to Jonah. It was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and he burned with anger. 
Jonah literally hated what God had done. He thought God was in the wrong. Is that shocking to you, that Jonah is mad at God? Jonah thought God should have done something differently than he did. Something Jonah wouldn't have done. Jonah would have had it to go, go it a different way. He's angry at God. But is that really that shocking to you? If you're honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Have you not ever been angry with God? That something happened to you? Something happened to your life? Has, has nothing really ever bad happened? Right? Or maybe to those that you love and those that you care about, things don't go as you thought they should have gone. And because you believe that, as Jonah does believe, that God is sovereign, He's absolutely sovereign, you know that things could have been different. God could have done something different, and He didn't do it. Things didn't go the way that you wanted it to go. This life-altering event didn't have to happen, but it did. Things could have been different, but they aren't. And because God is sovereign, we know things could have been different. I suppose for some people, this isn't a problem because some people have adopted a perverted theology that's known as open theism. And so in open theism, it's an easy out of this problem because God is just like you, right? He is uh, he's calling audibles on the line based off what happens in the world, right? He's been dealt, you guys are playing Texas Hold'em and God's been dealt cards just like you have. Except for maybe he's more powerful, maybe he has more knowledge of the world, but yet he's just still trying to play the cards he's been dealt to work things out in the best way possible. So when bad things happen, you can't really blame him because he is good and he's trying to work the world in a way where it just works out the best for everybody. But not even, not even atheists fall for that. Have you considered that atheists are mad, for God, mad at God for the same reasons that Christians get mad at God? Atheists know that God can do whatever He wants to do. And so the main problem with atheists, at least as I have seen, is not that there's any evidence, but there's evidence in the world that bad things happen. It's called the problem of evil and suffering. And so atheists' accusation and their anger is directed at God that things could be different, and they're not. And they can't reconcile what they see in the world and the God of the Bible. And so they mask that anger, right? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and they cover their, or try to, but it usually comes out pretty quickly that they're angry at God, in atheism. Because the truth of God's sovereignty is undeniable. Even atheists know that things could be different than they are. Now believers in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ, they too can become angry with God for the same reasons. God has providentially acted, and it's contrary to my will for my life. Or it's contrary to my will for someone that I love in their life. And I believe things shouldn't have happened. And so then I can become angry, not just at what happened, but I can become angry with the God who can do all things. And God did something Jonah didn't want. Jonah's will is not aligned with God's will. Jonah's heart is not aligned with his God's heart, and it burned him up. The text literally says it was evil to Jonah, a great evil, and he burned. How do we prevent becoming like Jonah when things don't go as we would like them to go? What is the medicine that I could prescribe to you now if you're in that situation, or the preventative medicine to take to prevent that from happening. It's very simple. It's the most famous prayer in the world. The Lord Jesus Christ gave this prayer to His disciples when they asked Him to teach, teach us, Lord, how do we pray? And He said this, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And as we pray that prayer, your will be done. What we're going to find is not that God changes His will or bends to meet our needs, but that God will, through the Spirit, 
conform our wills to submit to God's will. And in that we find peace when our will is bent and God's will is done. But Jonah's not there yet. He's not ready for that type of prayer. But Jonah does pray. And that's what he does next. Jonah will express his anger to God in a prayer. A prayer where he laments what has just happened. And in this prayer, it further reveals the sin in Jonah's own heart. So let's move on to that. The first movement of the text is Jonah's anger. The second is Jonah's prayer. Look back at your text at verse 2. Now remember that Jonah prayed in chapter 2. It's an incredible prayer. You see it if you look over at chapter 2. It even is, looks different in your text because it's a psalm. It's a thanksgiving psalm of Jonah. And so your text indicates that by how it is printed. And this prayer is amazing. In response to God's showering His mercy and grace upon Jonah in rescuing Jonah from the pit, remember that? As he is on the brink of entering into hell eternally, God miraculously rescues him Salvation is of the Lord. That's where that psalm ends. Jonah's psalm, it ends with that great statement. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And he's rejoicing in it. He's giving thanks for it. And he, and he makes these vows and says, I will come again and make sacrifices and worship you. He loves to experience the grace of God. And now he prays again. And the prayer is in stark contrast. The Ninevites experience what Jonah experiences. And now Jonah his prayer is not of thanksgiving. It's of lament. It's a complaint to God that God has acted in grace and mercy. Look at the prayer. Verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life for me, for it is better for me to, live, to die than to live. And Jonah reveals now why he didn't go. Why didn't he want to go to Nineveh? Because he knew God would be who he is. In this prayer, he lists several attributes of God that had already been revealed to the people of Israel. They were revealed in Exodus 34, 6-7. And if you go back and if you know the context of what's going on there, this is the second time that Moses receives the Ten Commandments. So the context even almost in a way contrasts with Jonah as Moses intercedes for his people. But the first time they got those tablets of the Ten Commandments, Moses comes down the mountain and he finds that they're worshiping a, an idol. They've already fallen into apostasy and paganism and they're worshiping a golden calf. And in anger he destroys the tablets God deals with His people. Moses intercedes for the people. And God says He's going to destroy the people. And Moses says, then blot my name out from your book. It's as if Moses says, I, I will die, you spare them. God is gracious and merciful, though, as we continue to read in Exodus. And He gives them the Ten Commandments again. Now, when He gives the Ten Commandments, God meets with Moses on the mountain. And as Moses meets with Him on the mountain, God comes and stands before Him and says this. Exodus 34, 6 through 7. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is what Jonah is, is quoting from here in his prayer. Keeping steadfast love to thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression from sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. The compassion of God. His merciful nature, His graciousness in giving sinners what they don't deserve, the God who gives favor, the God who is long-suffering, slow to anger, patient with sinners, abounding in steadfast love, that word has said, that word that captures so much of all of these other words combined into one, which manifests itself in the redemption from sin. These are wonderful, wonderful attributes of God. These aren't like accessories to God that sometimes He has and sometimes He doesn't. He's not a composite of these things built up into God. They are all His very essence. He is all of them or He's not God. And Jonah is mad that God was Himself. 
Jonah prays the attributes of God not as worship, but as an accusation. As, as an accusation to God. Jonah may have been obedient to go to Nineveh, but what we see is clearly he, he's only externally obedient, that Jonah's will is not aligned with God's at all. Jonah's heart is not like God's heart at all. And that's really the heart of the issue. Jonah's will is opposed to his God's will. Jonah doesn't want God to be God unless he is God like Jonah wants him to be. Because in Jonah's mind, God is only for Israel. And Jonah is fine with God being God toward Israel or God being God toward him and showing him grace and mercy. But to Gentile pagan sinners, the the worst sinners alive on the planet at the time, Jonah can't stand for that. God can't be God to them. And this is why he ran. Because he knew Nineveh might repent. And if they repent, he knew that God would shower them with grace and mercy. Now, it's usually at this point where preachers will divert into saying things like this. Jonah was a racist. Jonah didn't go to Nineveh because he was a racist. Jonah was a bigot. Or today in the modern vernacular, Jonah was guilty of othering people. Jonah othered people. That's the modern vernacular. So then they say, well, so who have you othered? Who have you othered? Different social class, the poor, different color, people of different religions. Have you othered those people? Emphasis on those people. There's us people, then there's those people. So don't be like Jonah. Don't be a racist. Don't be a bigot. I think that's a very superficial view and understanding of what's going on with Jonah and in the text. I think it's an imposition of modern ideas about race and racism, bigotry uh, on this text. Here's the reality. Jonah is a proud Jewish nationalist. That's what he is. He is a man true to his people. There's been clues to us in this, in this text. Remember, as the pagans on the boat bombard him with all these questions, what they really want to know is who's your God and what did you do to him? And he says, I'm a Hebrew. That's the very first thing he says. I'm a Hebrew. Jonah loves his people more than he loves the God of his people. And so Jonah will disobey his God when he's able to see the possibilities of what could happen in the geopolitical spectrum. What are the possibilities? Because Assyria is their enemy and they're growing in power. They're an existential threat to Israel. And so Jonah in this book, I believe what's happening is he's worried Nineveh will repent and they'll receive the mercy and grace of God. But remember, at this time, Israel is acting like a pagan nation. They're worshiping false gods. They're sacrificing children. They're engaged in sexual immorality. They're engaged in paganism. And God's sending them these prophets and the people of Israel will not repent. They won't. And so I I believe Jonah knows if I go to Nineveh and God shows them grace and mercy and they repent... God may likely use Nineveh to judge my people. And so Jonah runs. Because he's a good Jew. And he's a bad follower of Yahweh. How might we understand what is happening in Jonah's mind? How might we have done the same thing? I wonder if you've ever hoped for the destruction of China more than you have for its repentance and conversion. It seems fairly obvious that the chess pieces of the world are aligning themselves in such a fashion that there's going to be another great worldwide conflict, and the center of that is going to be China and us, and our children may likely serve and possibly die in that conflict. This would be like God being merciful to China and China prospering because God sends a mass conversion to China while we persist in our sin and rebellion and unbelief against God and then God potentially using China to judge us for our wickedness. So this would be like God being merciful to China and then you hoping and praying for their destruction because you want to save yourself and your own people. 
Well, perhaps he, he is doing that here. But we would remember, we should remember if we think that is too far unlikely or, or, or not a real scenario, that there are more Christians in China than there are people in the United States of America. And so we ask the question, have you prayed for the destruction of China or hoped for the destruction of China? That God would not send repentance to grant them mercy because we can clearly see how things are unfolding in our country. We're able to see that the heart of Jonah is very much like our own hearts. We just don't often think deeply about what's going on in our hearts. When good Americans who love their country wish for the downfall of other nations, they, they don't really do so from the position of racism, do they? Right? It's not racism involved at all. Or was it, I believe, with Jonah? They do it from a position of loving their country, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with loving your country. In fact, I would say it was wrong to not love one's country. It's good to love one's country, even love one's country so much that you'd be willing to lay down your life for it. In fact, I would fully expect that's what Christians would do in any other country in which they have been born and been raised and lived in. The world is a very complex place. As we have seen in World War II, Christians can be at war with each other in various nations. So there's actually something wrong with not loving one's nation. But when one loves one's nation more than one loves God's will, that's when there becomes a problem. And I think that's what's going on here in the text. I don't believe this is racism at all. I just believe Jonah is a good nationalistic Jew. But that doesn't mean it was sinful. Because that love for his nation led him to rebellion against his God. But also know this, Jonah very much here represents the nation of Israel as a whole. Right? Jonah is a man who stands as a representative in this text of an Israelite. We've seen Jonah foreshadow in typology the Lord Jesus Christ really in a negative way, and Jesus the positive. A prophet asleep in a boat, a man forsaken because of sin, a man swallowed by death for three days only to be resurrected from the dead, and his preaching to Nineveh and their repentance, all of this foreshadows the coming of Christ. But Jonah here, in a negative way, he also represents the people of Israel, who believed that because they were God's chosen people, they believed these things. They had exclusive claim to God because they were chosen. They were the elect people. Even though God told them His purpose for them and their choosing was to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles, to make God known among the nations, they believed they had exclusive claim to God. They had forgotten their, the reason that they existed. And that even though God has always had a heart for the Gentile nations, as they know from their, their stories that God told Abraham that through them all nations of the earth would be blessed, they've forgotten this promise. And also, because God chose them, because of their bloodline, because of their genealogy, they believed they were always right with God. Always. Because they had Abraham as their father. Jesus, he encounters this when he's preaching, and he goes about preaching, and, and he speaks of himself as one who will set those that are enslaved free. Anyone who sins is a slave of sin, but if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And the response of the Jews was, we've never been enslaved to anyone. We have Abraham as our father. And Jesus said, if Abraham was your father, you would do the works Abraham did, which is what? To believe the word of the Lord and be justified by faith. A whole chapter on that in Romans chapter 5. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's offspring, you would do what he did. But then he said, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. But see, the Jews, even to this day, and in Jesus' day, and in Jonah's day, they believed because God chose them, and because they were Jews by birth, they were always in the right with God and had exclusive claim to him. And they had forgotten their mission to take God's word to the world to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And because of this truth, Jonah had no heart for the lost. Jonah had no heart for the lost, which is God's heart. Israel had lost its purpose to make God known. 
in the world to sinners. And they believed all of that, and they still do to this day. Even though God's told them, He didn't choose them for any other reason except for by grace, that they were the smallest of all peoples when God chose them. For no other reason except for that God wanted to show them mercy and grace. After all, Abraham himself was a pagan. A pagan from Ur when God showed himself to him and made himself known. But they believed they had exclusive right to the mercy and grace of God. And it wasn't for those people. So Jonah is so angry about what happened. He wishes to die. He's so angry he wishes to die. It's better me, for me to die than it is to live, knowing, God, that this is what you've done. And just pause for a moment and let that sink in. The man who is rescued from death now wants God to kill him so he doesn't have to witness the love of God poured out upon an undeserving people. Something that he just experienced himself. Jonah is a man of irony and hypocrisy. And one commentator writes, and I think it's very insightful, he fled from the Lord in chapter 1 only to lament being banished from the Lord in chapter 2. In chapter 2, he praised God for saving his life only to pray in chapter 4 for God to take his life. Jonah is a living demonstration of how bad theology can disorder not just good theology, but it, will lead, it leads ultimately to despair. Because even though Jonah has, knows correct things about God and his character and nature, he has a limited understanding and view of how God might exercise his own sovereignty and his own will and how he might demonstrate those attributes outside the narrow view that Jonah has on how the world should work. Jonah's heart is not like his God's heart. Jonah's will is opposed to God's will. So much is Jonah's heart not aligned with God's heart that he would rather die than see God do what he wants. Jonah here is a polar opposite. Jonah here is the polar opposite of Jesus Christ. Right? In the DC universe, you have the flash and you have the reverse flash. Right? The exact opposite, opposite, the embodiment of the exact opposite of the hero. And in the Bible, you have King Saul. King Saul, who lives for his own name, is a coward who will not fight to defend the honor of God's name. And then you have David. Brave and valiant hero who fights for the honor of God's name. And here you have Jonah the polar opposite of Jesus Christ. He is the reverse Jesus. Jonah could not live knowing God would save worthless, pagan, wicked, evil people. He'd rather die than see it happen. Jesus, the Son of God, would gladly die. Would gladly die so that pagan, wicked, evil, undeserving sinners could experience the grace and mercy of God. Jonah is rebellious, reluctant, angry because God has showed mercy to sinners. Jesus is faithful, willing to die, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross so that God could show mercy to sinners. Jesus is the exact opposite of Jonah. You may think, how could I apply this to my life? I don't have this type of animosity toward anybody. I, after all, am not like Jonah when it comes to God saving sinners, even enemies. I don't have this problem. The problem Jonah has is not here. But the heart of the problem, what's at its very root, you likely have. The heart of the problem is this for Jonah. God has acted in a way that Jonah does not approve. And that will most certainly happen in your life. I can almost guarantee it. Sometime in your life, your life's going to go in a way that you don't want it to go. Could be catastrophic, could be not so big, could be an inconvenience. But a lot of times, eventually, it's something catastrophic. Something terrible happens to you. Something terrible happens to a loved one, to a friend, family member, whatever it may be. 
And because you know that God is sovereign, you know things could have been different and they're not. That's God's will. What happens is God's will. And you rebel against it in your heart. You become angry at the situation. You become angry at God for what He has done. And it will eat you alive like the worm ate that plant. can lead you to despair. can lead you to be angry at God, even angry enough to die. But friends, i got good news for you. If you belong to God, if He has set His love and mercy upon you, and you're His child, He's not going to leave you in that state. He's going to bring you out of that into conformity of His own nature, His own will, and His own purposes. Where we can come to the place where we can say, Your will be done. Where we can come to the place where we submit to what God has done. And God uses various means to accomplish that. And that's the exact thing, thing that we see here in this text. Next. God's answer. And God's answer is bringing Jonah. Or an attempt to bring Jonah out of that state. So the first movement of the text is Jonah's anger. Then we saw Jonah's prayer. And now we see God's answer. God's answer. We see God gracious again to Jonah. Instead of, if, if we're God, right, we're going to throw our hands up, enough grace and mercy for Jonah. You obviously never got it the first time, and we're done now, and now it's judgment time for Jonah. That's how the story would go if it was written by, by us. Jonah doesn't deserve it. He took it for granted. He got a second chance. He throws it back in God's face by wishing to die, being angry with God, actually thinking what God did was evil. But God doesn't lash out at Jonah. God doesn't pour down and rain down fire on his head or disintegrate him on the spot. The earth doesn't swallow up, open up and swallow Jonah whole because God is what Jonah has already professed to Jonah again. God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and merciful to Jonah. And it's revealed in his questions. God questions him. He, he is gracious in setting up this scenario and setting up this lesson for Jonah to learn and getting us to the last question. And he does it through a series of questions and through this strange series of events that happen in Jonah as he goes outside of the city. So that Jonah could see his own hypocrisy and see the indwelling sin in his own life. So God questions Jonah. The first question is this. If you look back at your text, you'll see it in verse 5. Do, or rather, verse 4. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? It's like saying, are you right to be angry? Or maybe better, are you justified? Are you justified in your anger? Is it true, right? What I've done is wrong. Are you justified in your anger? And the question forces Jonah to really stop looking externally at the situations and then begin to look inwardly at what's going on in his own life and in his own heart. Why is he so angry about what happened? And then the story unfolds now as Jonah receives this question to reveal to Jonah the truth about God, the truth about Jonah, and to probe us with the question. At the end. So verse 5, Jonah goes outside of the city. He builds a little shelter. He builds a little tent. And it gives him some shade from the sun. And then in verse 6, it says that God appoints a plant. So God appoints a supernatural plant. The plants don't grow up in a day. And this is another instance of God's absolute sovereignty revealed in this book. That God causes a plant to grow up in a single day. And it provides even more shade for Jonah, more than he already has. And it makes Jonah very happy. The text says to save Jonah from his discomfort. And there seems to be a play on words going on here. The word discomfort is evil. To save Jonah from his evil. So evil can mean discomfort, calamity, distress, or it can mean like moral evil. So there is possibly a play on words here. To, so, to save Jonah from his distress of the heat of the sun, the discomfort, but the whole scenario seems to be unfolding in a way that God could save Jonah from the evil that's in his own heart. So God graciously causes a miraculous plant to grow up in a single day, provide him shade. 
And Jonah's exceedingly happy. He's experiencing the grace of God. And that, that's how we live, right? We experience the grace of God and things are going well. We are exceedingly happy. And I can identify with this in particular so much because I, me and the son, we don't agree at all. We aren't friends, right? Go to a baseball game and the sun is beating down on my head and a cloud appears. And God saves me from my evil. And I just thank the Lord for that one cloud. And then the, the cloud goes away and the sun, it returns to beat down. And now I hate my life again. And so the sun is beating down, but God shades him. And he's so happy at the blessing of God. But then verse 7 through 8, God's not done appointing. God appoints a worm. And it attacked the plant, and the plant dies. So in a single day, this plant comes up, God appoints a worm, plant goes away. God, it's like God removes a blessing from his life. Now, he's not even really in a negative state, because he's where he was before. He already has somewhat of some shade from his, from his booth. But God removes that shade from Jonah's life. And I love this text. Like, just look at it. It's, it's amazing to see. God appointed a worm. We like to think of the sovereignty of God as like moving nations and like moving all of human history forward. The great sovereign God over the planets and kings and setting them up and removing them. But here we see that God is God of worms. Think of that. But God is sovereign over a single worm. And the worm removes God's blessing from Jonah's life. The plant dies. And then God appoints something else. He appoints a scorching east wind so that the sun beat down on the head of Jonah. These winds are known to occur in the region. Many of you probably experience them. So if you were in northern Iraq, what happens is the wind will sweep down off the mountains of Iran and then they'll blast where Nineveh is at. Something similar happens in California. But the winds could get up to 70 miles an hour, but as they sweep across that arid ground, it's 120, 125 degrees, then now a 70 mile an hour blast of hot air hits you. You could, I suppose, get a motorcycle and experience something here in August similar if you just want to drive down the road. You can take my word for it. I can tell you that's what it's like, or you can try it for yourself. But it's absolutely miserable. And so God sends a dark providence into his life. Not only did he remove the blessing, but he sends this dark providence into Jonah's life. And Jonah is so distressed now, he asks God that he would die. Do you, do you do well to be angry because of the plant? Look what God says. Do you do well to be angry? Verse 9, because of the plant. And Jonah said, yes, I do well to be angry enough to die. And now the story unfolds where God will teach us this lesson. God says, you pity the plant or have compassion. The word can mean compassion. You pity the plant or you have compassion on this plant for which you did not labor. You did not cause it to grow. It came up in a night and it disappeared in a night. And people usually don't have pity on plants, right? Or compassion on plants. But what God is pointing out here is that Jonah is angry and concerned about something that he had nothing to do with. This plant had nothing to do with Jonah. His, the plant just becomes an outlet for Jonah's anger at God and what he's done with Nineveh. This is God's plant, right? That's the point. You didn't, you didn't plant it. You didn't make it grow. God ordained the plant. He cultivated the plant. He caused it to grow. He caused it to be eaten by a worm, and he caused it to die because it's God's prerogative. It's his plant. And Jonah, in his selfishness, sees that he has a right to the plant because it gives him comfort. And then now God argues from the lesser to the greater. Arguments from the lesser to the greater are Jesus' favorite teaching method. They're Jesus' favorite teaching method. So in Matthew 7, 9 through 11, here's just an example of an argument from the lesser to the greater. Or which one of you, if your son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good, give good things to those who ask Him? So if our earthly Father is good, how much greater is our heavenly Father? If our earthly Father is not going to give us a serpent, 
how much more is our Heavenly Father going to bless His children? And this is Jesus' favorite teaching method. And surprise, wouldn't you know, that's the same teaching method that's going on here. Because if you remember, surprise, Jonah is talking to a pre-incarnate Christ. God is the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, forever. Jonah is in the school of Jesus, and God argues from the lesser to the greater. So, you pity the plant, an inanimate object, which you did nothing. You didn't plant it. You didn't cause it to grow. You didn't cause it to become great. Should I not pity Nineveh or have compassion? That's what God asks. Should I not have compassion upon Nineveh, which I planted, which I caused to grow in this massive great city of which I have plans for? Oh, and by the way, is which is filled with people made in my image. Image bearers of God, human beings. Should I not have compassion upon this city? And then he adds this comment. These people who do not know their right hand from their left. There are 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left. It's been argued by some that this is children. That children haven't reached the age where able, they're able to discern right from wrong. And so they're, they're innocent of any of the sins of Nineveh, of their wickedness, of their violence, of their terrorism. So should they die along with everyone else? That's a possibility. But here's another. That it doesn't mean children. That it's a term that stands for because we, and we know they're not guilty by their own admission. We know it doesn't stand for innocent people because by Nineveh's own admission, they're evil and violent and wicked, and they repent. So they're guilty. The term means something like, because they do not have the law of God, they're, able, they're not able to distinguish between actions which are pleasing to the Lord and those which do not. So they are guilty, but they're ignorant. They're ignorant in their guilt. This term is a Hebrew idiom, to not know the right from the left. And it means the ability to distinguish between things. So in 2 Samuel 19.35, we find it used of an 80-year-old priest who used to test the wine for David. But now he's so old, he's not able to taste and to see and distinguish between the right and the left. He doesn't know what's good and what's bad anymore. It's also used in a negative example in Ezekiel as a description of the priests of Israel who have become negligent in their duty as priests to the people of God. Here's what we read in Ezekiel 22, 26. It says, Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common, neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. So the priests aren't distinguishing between the right and the left. So here in this city, we have established already their guilt but they are a part of the Gentile world. They have no revelation from God. They are not able to distinguish from their right and their left as to what pleases the Lord and what doesn't please the Lord. And Jonah doesn't care. Jonah doesn't care, but God cares. That's the whole point of the story, is that God cares about those who have never heard of His fame or seen His glory and don't have access to His revelation, and they're in ignorance. It is, a, is actually, after all, the whole reason for Israel's existence. And it's the very thing that they forgot. To make the glory of Yahweh known among the pagan Gentile nations that they would become a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Isaiah 49.6, he says, Is it too light a thing for, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. That would be written only maybe 20 years after this story. But before that, to Moses, we received this instruction from the Lord in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4, 6-8. God tells them to keep His law. He says, keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who then, when they hear of all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near as, it is to, as the Lord our God is to us? whenever we call upon Him. And what great nation is there that has the statutes and these rules so righteous as all this law 
that I set before you today. This is God's purpose for Israel. Is that there wouldn't be peoples who can't distinguish between the right and the left. But it is the very thing that Jonah refuses to do. Jonah is here contrasted very sharply with his God. And remember, Jonah represents the people of Israel at this time. God cares about sinners. God cares about Gentiles. God wants to make himself known to people who have never heard of him. God cares. Jonah does not. And this question is left here hanging there this morning. It's left there hanging. As if the question is, is pointed directly at us. You care about all this stuff in your life. You care about inanimate objects, probably deeply. You care about money. You care about your family. You care about your own people. You care about God, especially when God sets his mercy on you and things go well in your life. When God seems as being good to you. But do you actually share in the heart of God? That's where this question is driving. Do you care about human beings made in the image of God? who have never heard God's word, never heard of God's fame, who have never heard God's ways, who do not have access to God's revelation for themselves, who have never heard the name Jesus ever in their life. People who are rightly before God, as Romans 1 makes explicitly clear to us that no one is righteous. There's no one righteous as, as that unfolds in the rest of Romans, but in Romans chapter 1, we see how all people are guilty before God. We suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And do we actually care that there are people who live and die have never heard of God in this world? They've never seen a Bible. They've never heard the name Jesus. They've never heard the gospel. People who will perish without the knowledge of God. Who will suffer under His wrath. God cares about them God wants them to come to know Him. And the question is, do you care? Do you care as God cares? Friends, God cares so much, as, we, as, we, as I already mentioned in the very beginning with Kat Von D. John 3.16, that God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. He so loved the pagan, Gentile, tattoo-filled, nose-ringed, ear-ringed, pagan, demon-worshipping world that he sent his son into that dark world. That you forget, like we, we just take that verse for granted, John 3.16, of course God loves the world, but you forget how evil the world is. And you forget that you're part of that world, and you're included in that word world. That you, just as much as Nineveh, don't deserve for God to show his love in that way. For God so loved. How did He love? He sent the very best of what He had. He sent His only Son. Not an angel. Not an animal sacrifice. His own Son. To bear the sins of all who would come to Him and repent and believe. God cares. And the question is, do we care? It reveals how God loves. That He sent the greater prophet from Galilee into the world. God loved Nineveh, and He sent them Jonah. God loved the world, and He sent His Son, who would die so that the world could receive mercy. And then Jesus commissioned His apostles and His prophets to take that good news into the world, that He is the Lord of grace and mercy, that salvation is of the Lord, and it is found only in Jesus Christ. Truly God truly man, who was born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless life that no one could live on behalf of sinners. Jesus said, you will not even see the kingdom unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. And you think you can do that. And the point is, is you can't. But he can. He was perfect and holy, and he lived a sinless life. And because he did, he could die on behalf of sinners. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't for his sin. He was perfect. It was for the sin of every single person that would believe in him. 
And if you're here today and you're a sinner and you want that for yourself, all you must do is believe on Jesus Christ. That's it. We're not asking you to become like cleaned up like everybody wants Kat Von D to become cleaned up. You just come to Jesus as you are in your sin and He'll take it from you. And He'll give you His own righteousness. You'll find forgiveness of sins. It will fall off you like a weight. He'll adopt you as His own. And Jesus rose from the dead and so He then also can give us eternal life. He promises us eternal life. Jesus commissioned the apostles and the prophets with this message to take this news into the world. As Jesus himself is the light of the world, what the Jews failed to do, Jesus is, and he succeeds at doing. John 8, 12, Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will, what, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He then commissions his apostles and prophets and his church to take this gospel into the world, and then we become that light. We become a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Matthew 5, 14 through 15. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. Jonah was sent. Jesus was sent. The apostles were sent. And you're sent. And there are billions of people around this world right now who have never heard of Jesus. They've never seen a Bible. There are thousands upon thousands of people here in our city today who have never heard of Jesus. They don't know what the gospel is. They don't know of God's gracious nature, His loving kindness displayed toward us and the sending of His Son. They can't distinguish their right from their left. The world is Nineveh. Oklahoma is Nineveh. Lawton is Nineveh. Salvation is of the Lord. The wicked are perishing in their sin. What will you do? It ends with this question. What will you do? Would you withhold from them the grace of God as Jonah wanted to do? What do you believe? Should God not have compassion on them? Do you have compassion on them? Those undeserving of the grace of God do you have compassion? Do you have the heart of God for sinners? That's what this question is driving at. Do you share the heart of God for sinners? Yes or no? Three movements in the text which force a personal self-examination. Jonah's anger, Jonah's prayer, God's answer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we must confess that we often don't share in your heart for sinners. We love to receive grace and mercy from you when it is applied to us. But then, God, we are complacent at best when it comes to those who we may look at and see as unsavable outside your ability or right to save. So God, we pray that through this text, this question at the end, that you would grant us repentance and change our hearts to see that you are a God for all peoples. God that wants to be known among everyone. Even the worst sinners are not outside of the power of your saving grace. So God, conform us back into that same heart. Conform our will to your will. Give us a heart like yours to love people that don't deserve it so that we might take the gospel to them. Lord, if there are those here that have never come to know you, never experienced your saving grace and your mercy. God, we ask that you would pour out upon them as you did in Nineveh repentance and belief that they would see Jesus as worthy of laying everything down for, of leaving all of their sin behind 
to see him as the most precious treasure of the universe, the one who can give them fulfillment and eternal life and real purpose and meaning. God, I pray that you would give them repentance of their sins, even right now. Call them to yourself. You're a God of great love and great mercy. You've been so patient with us, Lord. Now we pray that you would demonstrate your love and kindness yet again, the saving of sinners. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.